Happy Book Club Thursday, Paper and Glam readers. Today we are discussing our July selection, Love Lives Here by Maria Goff. And before we pop into our discussion, we are going to do a really fun icebreaker tonight. A lot of us listen to the What Should I Read Next podcast, and it's by Ann Vogel. And she has this format of a podcast where you tell her one book you love or a couple books you love, one book you hate, and what you're reading lately, and she tells you what you should read next. So I thought it would be really fun to do that live, and I'm not going to try to be like the book whisperer like she is. So we all together are going to tell Margie what she should read next. And if you think this is super fun, I would love volunteers for next month to do a little what should what should I read next icebreaker. And you can be a, of course, our, one of our live chatters and those of you who are joining live. So leave me a comment if you want to be on for next episode. You won't be live, don't worry, unless you want to be, in which case I'd love to have you with us. But it'd be so fun to add lots of titles to your TBR list and switch up our icebreaker a little bit. So Margie, would you like to tell us one book you love, one book you really don't like, and what you're reading right now so we can all fill out your TBR list? Yes. Um, it was hard to pick the book I loved because there have been so many good ones. The one though that I have reread several times in the last five years is Ready Player One, um, which is funny because I feel like that's not my normal genre of like action, sci-fi stuff. But that book was so well written. It was so fun. It was so fast paced. Um, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. So it the fact that it was set there, I could even recognize some landmarks. So it was just really fun. I loved that book and that story. I even loved the movie. Um, even though they had to switch it up a little bit, it was still just, it captured the spirit of that book as well. Um, a book that I hated, which I feel like is controversial, but I just didn't like it, was The Handmaid's Tale. Um, I couldn't get into it. I thought there were parts that didn't matter. I hated the writing. I was just not in it at all. I didn't connect with any of the characters. There was no one super likable um, for me. I just, and I know it's this huge hit thing. I can't even bring myself to like watch the Hulu show because I didn't like the book so much, even though I'm sure the show is great. Um, but yeah, that was one that I sincerely disliked. Um, so before you proceed, tell us tell us why you don't like it. Like what? Like was it really dark? Did you think it was boring? Like tell us tell us why. I love this book, so I'm super curious. I'm a little emotionally invested, but yeah. it also will help me pick out books for you because I have no idea. So funny. Um, I didn't connect with anyone. I felt like it could have been written better. <laughs> like the story idea is fine and great like you know it's an interesting idea and plot but I the way it moved was too slow and too I couldn't connect the dots in my head so it may have just been me I listened to it as well so I didn't read it um like have a physical copy and maybe that was it, but I just kept wishing it was over. Like, I was like, I'm just done. Can we just make this go even faster? Like, I'm listening to it on double speed because no part of me enjoyed it. And I don't know why. Like, if it was the season of life I was in or what. But I couldn't connect at any level. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, right now, I just started... The Signature of All Things um, by Elizabeth Gilbert. It's her novel. And I started it a couple weeks ago. Um, we're actually reading it for our church book club. So I started a couple weeks ago um, and then put it down because I was trying to finish this one and another one and all of that. And then I picked it up again a couple days ago and like fully got in it and it was invested and I left it at the house where I was nannying so I haven't had it for two days and I'm like I want my book back I would have um, driven over there <laughs> no, I was, I'm so sad <laughs> like, 
I'll wait till Sunday. I'll like, cause I still had to finish this and you know, other things on my shelf. I was like, I'll be patient, but I, I'm only probably 60 or 70 pages in and I'm like, I want to know what happens. Like this is, she was just a fantastic writer. Um, all the detail is great. All the backstory to the person who eventually is the main character is great. So yeah, I'm loving it, but I'm like just starting and I don't have it with me. So yeah. So I have this on my TBR list. I love Elizabeth Gilbert. I've Big Magic is one of my all-time favorite books. I know, Erica, you would say the same. I think you were the one who were like, you have to read this immediately. So I love it. I love the Ukraine love. Um, so have you read other Elizabeth Gilbert stuff? Because I'm struggling a little bit because I've only read The Handmaid's Tale. I haven't read Ready Player One. I know about it, like, of course. But um, I haven't. And I haven't read Signature of All Things. I know you obviously personally. So I know you like a lot of fiction. Yeah. But um, tell us a little bit about your reading style, just personally, um, in case we haven't read those books like, like me. Right. Um, I feel like I'm kind of all over the place. I just read The One Man, which is a World War II, um, a guy has to break into Auschwitz and get someone out story. So it's very intense. Um, but I, I finished it and I left it um, home in Ohio for my dad to read because he a crazy reader right now um i loved that so any world war ii stories historical fiction um other like fun fiction i'm also trying to read my way through like amazon and goodreads top 100 list um i have some big books left so i'm a little bit scared about reading some of those um but I am, for the most part, enjoying some of those classics, like trying to read several classics a year. I read Gone with the Wind, loved it. It was probably my book of the year this year. Um, I mean, we're not done with this year, but it's that one's going to be hard to beat. Yeah, that's a killer. We read that together two years ago, July 2016. If you guys are new to the Paper and Glam Book Club, it was a favorite of a lot of ours. So if you would like to read it and then watch the book chat. That would be so fun. I, it's one I want to reread for sure. Sorry, go ahead, Margie. That one was fantastic. So I feel like I'm all over the place. Like, I love my summer chick lit. I've definitely read some of those this year. Um, even the crazy, like, I watched Jane the Virgin and then read the book because I was like, I just want to. It's cute. It's fun. It's whatever. So all the way to, like, you know, more heavy hitters or whatever. So I feel like I'm across the board. I'm normally not a huge sci-fi person, um, but I did love Ready Player One. And the new one out my husband just read, I haven't read it yet, Children of Blood and Bone. Um, okay. Yeah, and he loved it and he devoured it and he doesn't normally do that with books. Um, so the fact that he was fully invested makes me excited to read it. So, Yeah, that one's been on What Should I Read Next quite a few times, actually, recently. And the book that is coming to mind for you is, have you read the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society? I never have. And oh. everyone's told me to. My I mom is probably ready to beat me up because I haven't read it yet. But okay, well, the time is now because it comes out on Netflix August 10th. So, oh, okay. Like, and I know it's small. It's not very big. Like no, it's like really tiny. Be able to read it in a day. So I do. I'll put that one on my list. Yeah, that I think you would love. I'm like halfway through it. I'm I'm in the middle of about four different books. I'm in the middle of a Jen Lancaster book, Handmaid's Tale, that book, and um, uh, a book about dogs because <laughs> um, I just love dogs. I'm obsessed with Sunday. She's my life. Anyway, all right. So. Who has a suggestion for Margie? I am so excited to see what you guys think. So many of you are like super readers. No. Um, I have one. But so, <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure, like, because I know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Dumb. <laughs> I'm dumb. Uh, so I, I had two thoughts, and you said my first thought, which was <laughs> Lawrence, um, potato papaya, whatever, like the long title is. Yeah. And the other one that came to mind was the Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver. And um, it's about a missionary family in the Congo. 
and it's all of their daughter's perspectives. I don't know if you've read it or you're familiar with yes. it. Um, that's one of my favorites. So I, like, I was like, that would be high up on my list, but yeah, I mean, that just sounds like something that definitely would be. Yep. Very- Sorry, I was shouting in the comments, <laughs> seeing if anyone has any suggestions. Okay, you guys, we got to give Margie some some thoughts. Erica, you are you are like three hundred books a year, girl. What about you? I'm putting you on. Margie, do you like do you read series or do you like standalones? Are you okay with series? Yes. Okay. Both. Um, the one series that I thought of for you, um, just because it's kind of not really apocalyptic. Um, but it's a little bit dark, but it's fast paced. It's sci-fi, but I enjoyed it and I don't enjoy sci-fi either. Um, it's the Unwind series by Neil Schusterman. It's YA. Um, it is about, um, it's set in the future and they have outlawed abortion, but they made it to where when the kids are, I forget what age it is. Uh, it's between certain ages. Um, you can like sign up to unwind them, which basically means they are their bodies and their 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 bodies are taken and farmed for parts, basically. Um, and so it's about like three different kids that are selected to be unwinds. They escape, and then kind of what happens to them throughout the next couple years or so. I don't. The whole series is four books. Uh, I don't know how much time it traces but um that's a really fast read but um and it's pretty serious too that you can probably tell from the description Mm -hmm. um but like it it's one of those books that makes you think but it keeps you engaged and i think it has characters that you want to see like succeed like that you can kind of root for even though they're not perfect um and then the other one i thought of was children of blood and bone i thought you might enjoy that too that sounds awesome. So I wrote down Unwind for sure. I have Children of Bloody Mode sitting on my shelf because my husband had to buy it. So um, that one will be coming up soon. But yes, I love a good series like that. Especially, it sounds like it'd be fun to listen to, um, which I've gotten into as well. So. so we have lots of good recommendations for you from those of us who joined us live. I'm so excited. So, um, Mandy Pritchard says a historical historical fiction recommendation is The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. I have not read that that one, but that one comes up on what should I read next all the time, as well as The Great Alone, her new one. I don't know if you read any Kristen Hanna. I have not. Yes. Um, I read The Nightingale. I was halfway through The Great Alone because I was listening to it. And my time ended, so I'm waiting because I was like in the middle. So I have to get that one back too. And she also recommended Celeste Ng's Little Fires Everywhere. That was a book of the month pick. And so many people have loved that one. Yes, I have not read that one yet. So it's definitely on my list as well. Awesome. And then uh, Sarah Piper recommends Kate Morton's The Secret Keeper. Ooh. Yeah, Sarah is a super reader. <laughs> and uh, I have not read any any uh, Kate Morton. There's one of her books I haven't written down um, that the Anne Bogle said would be like the ideal October read. And I have it like tent- tentatively on our list for not next year, but um, like for like a seasonal kind of fall read. But anyway, I think that about wraps it up for our What Should I Read Next icebreaker. I hope you guys thought that was fun. I would love to do this kind of, this was like a spur of the moment idea because I was like, what should I do for the icebreaker? But I think it was fun and I'd love to do it again next year for one of you that's watching live. Uh, So if you would like to let me know right now in the comments or leave me a comment if you're watching the replay and I'll have you email me, um, you know, the books that you're loving, books that you don't like, a book that you're reading now and we'll put it up in the Facebook group, the Paper and Glam Book Club Facebook group, and see what the community thinks you should read next. And then we'll discuss it uh, as our icebreaker next month. So I think that'd be so fun. All right, moving into the book. So we're gonna start with our typical first question. What was your experience reading Love Lives Here? How many stars would you rate it? 
And if you've read Love Does or uh, Bob Goff's new book, Everybody Always, how did you think they compared? So I guess I will go last. And I know book chatters, I did not paste the order. Let me do that now. So can I toss the floor over to you, Margie? What did you think of Love Lives here? I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I gave it a three on Goodreads, which sounds harsh. I think I would really give it like a 3.5, um, mostly just because of the writing. Like I can kind of tell that she's not a writer. Um, and so I almost think it would have helped her to have someone who was a writer. Um, and I noticed she had editors and stuff, but I think I got hung up sometimes on like, she was a little bit repetitive of certain things, but I loved her. Like, I feel like she came across well and what she feels is like her life mission with her family and her home. Um, and I loved that. And I did really appreciate her stories. And she had a lot of good like quotes and one liners um, that were great. But I think it was, I was reading it pretty quickly and I was like, this isn't, it just didn't, go as smoothly as I feel like Shauna Nyquist or some of the other writers who have written about their lives. Um, but that may be too nitpicky. I don't know. So I'm like a giant Donald Miller and Shauna Nyquist fan, as you guys may know, and they're like besties with the goths. So, um, which I, I know, you know, Margie, but, um, did, so were you expecting Maria to be a better, like more of a writer's writer because she spends so much time with writers? Yeah, I think I was expecting it to be, I mean, Shauna Nyquist and Donald Miller can get like really deep. Like yeah. they can go to those places that like C.S. Lewis goes to. Yeah. Um, and this didn't do that for me at all. And I think I semi expected it to. Now I haven't read the others. So I haven't read any of Bob, Bob Goff's books. Um, so I, maybe I just came in with a weird expectation, but like, those are ones like Nyquist and Donald Miller are ones that I can go back to over and over and you get something new out of it every time. And I don't feel like that with this book. Um, so I feel like I read her story. I know who she is. I super appreciate the way she lives her life. Um, Cause I feel like her, actually. And so I loved that, but it just wasn't as deep maybe as I was expecting. Yeah, I guess I'll chime in and say kind of what I was thinking, because otherwise I'm just going to repeat you at the end. <laughs> um, I completely agree. So, you know, C.S. Lewis, Donald Miller, and Shannon Quist are probably like my trinity of favorite authors because they just continue to blow my mind. And things that I read five years ago, like you said, like they'll come back to me and blow my mind because I really didn't get it the first time. And it, they just don't get old for me. And then when I read Love Does, I loved it. I hadn't really read anything like it. Um, you know, Bob Goff, I wouldn't say, is like a writer's writer in the same way that Donald Miller or Shannon Nyquist is, but he, his book was just so good. I loved how he approached his life with such whimsy, and it came at a time for me when I was, I just had so much belief that Paper and Glam was going to take off eventually, and it just hadn't, and it had been like, you know, five years, and I was like, oh, how am I going to get this thing going? It's like, I kind of felt pregnant, not that I've been pregnant, but I just felt like, oh, I got to get this thing out of me, and, and I also felt this intense pressure to have, like, a legitimate job. Um, you know, I felt like I, you know, couldn't just make stickers for a living, because... I needed to do something legitimate, whatever that means. And um, I just felt that pressure maybe because I, you know, went to business school and kind of just, they kind of prep you for like the corporate track. But um, then I read Love Does and I was like, wow, like you can't, like somebody else is approaching their life with like so much whimsy, but also doing really meaningful work. And I don't think, you know, those are mutually exclusive at all. And, but it felt like that was the culture. I mean, not so much anymore. Like the creative space has blown up in, in such a way, but you know, this book came out like right after like Instagram, you know, came online, you know, it was, it's such a different time uh, now than when Love Does came out six years ago, but it really, really profoundly impacted me. And I read it again and I, I didn't quite 
It didn't hit me quite as hard, but I still just loved it. So my expectations for Love Lives here were really high, especially because um, Donald Miller and Sean Equist were like blowing it up. Um, so anyway, I, I felt the same way. It's like three stars. Um, it's not like a book I'm gonna like force on everyone, although I know I forced it on all of you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I kind of just, I think I went into it with like really high expectations and that might have set Maria up to fail a little bit, even though she's awesome and I totally loved her and I related to so much of of, of what she shared. So yeah, completely agree. Um, Erica, what did you think? Yeah, I, actually, as I was listening to my talk, I was like, oh, I don't even have to get everything I was going to say. Um, but yeah, I would give it three and a half stars. Um, I found like, I really like Maria Goff. I, like, I really like Bob Goff and all that they do. Um, but even with like, I've read Love Does and I felt the same way about his like, the stuff that he's saying, I'm like, oh yeah, that's good. But it was like the writing, I felt like there was a disconnect somewhere, like trying to think, uh, almost like, well, what I noticed but with this book, I, it's been so long since I read Love Does, I'm not gonna try to um, talk about that book. But um, this book, it was like, within each chapter, like she'll start off with a metaphor and then she moved on to other metaphors. And I understand like what she was saying, but it was like the metaphors almost pulled me out of her story a little bit rather than pulling me into it. Um, and so I, I just didn't feel like I was connecting to the story as much, even though I was connecting to her as a person. Um, like I didn't necessarily um, feel invested in like okay well i have to see what happens next um i need to like know every part of this story that she's telling about her life um i thought it was good i enjoyed reading it um which is why it's like a three and a half you know i liked it um i'm glad that i read it um I, I it just wasn't a book that i like fully with like a lot of other books that we've read Uh, I agree with uh, everything Marty and Erica both said. Um, I, uh, I I got through it fairly easy. Um, for me, I think it's between a three and a three and a half star. Um, for me, this book uh, almost felt like um, it was the form of catharticism for her for you know the loss that she experienced in the fire. Um, I, it was almost like um, something someone would write to try um, you know, a little bit of a, as a therapy tool to kind of get her feelings out there, kind of um, uh, try to deal with it and try to understand how she's feeling about it and kind of process it. Um, that was kind of the sense that I got out of it. Um, you know, obviously it's, we've all suffered loss. Um, that part is relatable. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree with what Erica said. I don't think it's something I'll go back to or or necessarily force on anyone. Like I would, you know, obviously cold tangerines or something where, you know, anyone you talk to, you have to tell about that book. But um, all in all, like I said, it wasn't too hard to get through, but um, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll find a spot on the bookshelf, I guess. Um, yeah, I give it two and a half, three stars to, um, Nonfiction. This is like one of the books written. Books written like this are why I'm like ah, nonfiction. It's just not my thing. It's because so much nonfiction is written, kind of like this, where it's just like you can speed read it. It's just a lot of platitudes and anecdotes, and I'm like, that's nice. I can talk to my friends and find out about their lives too. And um, I don't know. And, and it's hard because I'm reading a different book at the same time. I started it before. And it's, it's also a Christian author, but it's, um, like, it's very applicable to, like, something that, to, like, dealing with my son and how he's different. And it's written by a mother and a son. And he has all of these, he's an adult now, but it's about, like, raising him. And that's written so strongly com like, compared to this. So I think reading something at the same time that is um, a little more deep and meaningful and goes to some of those places um especially like the part that's written by the sun in that one it, it makes it like oh this one was like it's not fluff but it's just like those are some nice stories which i think sometimes in my experience with christian nonfiction happens like there's like 
a lot of nice stories of how we apply God in our life and that's what they are. And they're great stories for us to read. That way we know we're not alone, but they're not like the CS Lewis deep, um, theologically strong, poignant things. Um, I, I completely agree with Jaina. It's um, this category is difficult for me, but um, I would say two and a half, three. Um, like I said, I, I like stories and um, things that feel self-helpy for me. I, it's just hard. Like I'm listening, but I'm not listening. Like, so I listened to the book and so I'm like, okay, so I'm going through and I'm listening. And then there's some times where I'm like, okay, well, I'm, it doesn't like keep me, doesn't just like keep my attention and grab me. Um, there was like some really nice quotes. Um, but it's like, I feel like I can get that. I don't know. I get some of this kind of stuff from some of my friends and when I go to church and like when I hear sermons, like, so that's why it's so hard for me. Cause it's like, I don't feel like I would go back to it. Um, and like you guys said, I don't feel like I would recommend it to someone unless someone was looking for something like that. So, um, you know, I, it's just hard for me to, to, to gauge, um, these types because it's like, I mean, you're not saying anything bad, but it's kind of like, well, yeah, I've kind of heard that before. So I would just say, yeah, two and a half, three. Yeah. Well, I think we're all in agreement, which is which is interesting. I think sometimes we'll have a couple of us think a book is five stars and a couple of us will be one star and that's fun too. So yeah, the other thing that kind of threw me off with this book is it just was marketed completely different than what it was. Like even the title is finding what you need in a world telling you what you want. And I thought it was going to be a lot more about like consumer culture and kind of a, a little bit more of a counterculture manifesto. And maybe that's just because what I want to read because like living in LA, it's like you drive down the street, like literally three blocks and you've seen 20 billboards, which can be fun, but you know, like it's, it's kind of the world telling you, you know, what, what you need. So I don't know. I, yeah, I'm a little disappointed because this is totally my genre of choice, but I don't read a lot of it. I just have my authors that I just absolutely love who have, I would say changed my life. So, um, I expected that to be one of these books, but anywho, that's all right. Next question is, was there a particular story or chapter you found memorable or moving? I'll go last because I have a, I have a couple. Did you have a favorite, Margie? Her, I was telling my husband this right before book club started, but I felt so much like I was like her, um, like that her one goal was to have a family and be a wife and a mom and create a home. And I feel like I, in that sense, I was like, yep, I'm bored. Like, this is me. This is what I want to do. This is like all of her things relating to that. I completely got, I, those were good takeaways. Like just some of those ideas, the one like moment that kind of stuck out was when she talked about people coming over to eat um because my husband and i have both talked about that like we should invite more people over to eat we both love to cook like he might be a better cook than me um he's definitely more creative in the kitchen but then she, you know she talked about having people over for dinner and then when they're done they get under the table and sign the table and i was like done i want to do this like i want a place that's that where i can remember and see that people have been to our house and eaten at our table and done all of that. So I think that just that moment stuck out and I may copy them in that regard. Man, Mark, you, you and me are like totally on the same page. Cause that was, that's just like the one thing that I really remember specifically about the, like everything that she said, um, that's like, Oh, I want to do that. Um, but the, I don't even remember where it was. Um, which chapter it was in or if it was just spread out throughout the book um but uh she talks a lot about how you know bob's this extrovert type or seven on the enneagram and she's an introvert and a type nine and like i'm a type nine i'm an introvert so i really relate to that um and my husband is an introvert but he's an outgoing 
introvert. Uh, so everybody thinks he's an extrovert. Um, and like, he, like, there's a line in there that says, Bob's mission in life is um, to change the world and mine is to make, or to make the world a better place. And mine is to make my family better for future generations. I don't remember her exact wording. Um, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is like what my husband says every day when we're praying with our kids is to help us make the world a better place. And like, I feel like he's like actively out there doing it because he's interacting with like hundreds of teenagers every day at school. And like, always like all these stories about how like these kids from these like totally messed up situations, like they're, they come to him and he's the one person that they trust. And I'm like, I'm sitting here at home, like cooking dinner. And it can like, if I let it, I can be like, I'm not doing anything. Um, but just like how she looks at, you know, he has his role, I have mine. And we don't try to like pull each other into the other role or um, get down on ourselves for not doing what the other person is doing. And uh, I just, it's one of those things that, like we should all know, like we're all different. We all have different strengths. Um, but I think sometimes we can all get a little bit, lose sight of that a little bit. And so that was a good reminder, I think. That's great, Erica. I love, I love the point that you just made. And uh, um, I love the point that you made and she made about the, the stigma about the stay at home mom. I think we've come a long way um, as far as, uh, as people's perspective on that. Um, but uh, yeah, I respected the fact that uh, that was her, her life work and um, what more honorable thing to be doing. Um, my favorite story actually was the one about the jeweler. Um, I thought there was some uh, wonderful points in here and I actually really, really love the, the little story. It was one of, one of the shorter chapters, but it was really good. Um, no spoiler alert, alerts or anything, like no spoilers. Um, if you're going to read the book, I think this is, uh, this is one that, uh, that you might appreciate it, might appreciate and it speaks a lot to, uh, to again loss, but I found this book really to be about loss and how to deal with it and how to recover and how uh, to kind of get past things. So um, yeah, anyway, I thought uh, The Jeweler was a great chapter, great story. that story was a good story Cindy and I kind of like forgot about it but I remember when I read it it made me think of like the cupcake brown book from last last month and then I was like what if she was involved in that and like because of like the time frame and when it happened I was like I totally like that was my thought um the story that stood out to me and it's just because like I also have a toy poodle is like the one about her dog and my husband bought me these dogs and he like gave them to me like the day after Thanksgiving, but like in a stocking, like as an early Christmas present. And then he like hates the dogs, like, cause they follow me around and they're obsessed with me, especially like there's two of them, but one is like obsessed, obsessed with me. And he's like the one who's always sick out of like, he, like I've spent like $300 this month on like his ear infection, you know, like, and he just follows me around. If I sit down, he sits on my feet or on my lap and he will whine at the door for me. And he will stare at me if I'm sitting on the bed cause he can't jump on the bed anymore and he'll whine until I pick him up. And so like, that was just like, Oh, I have, I have that poodle. I own that poodle that that is mine and he is obsessed. And so it just made me think about that. Um, obviously there are a lot more meaningful stories out there than the dog, but that really just stood out to me because it was something that was it's just like, if you own a little poodle that's obsessed with you, you understand. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> excuse me. So one of the, the stories that I liked, it was when the, she was preparing for the diplomats to come over for dinner. And she goes through this list in her head about, okay, I need to paint the house and I need to um, just, you know, get the china, have everything perfect. And, and realizing that that's actually not a reality and how she just had to let it go and just, you know, allow her family to just be themselves and, you know, eat on paper plates. And then when the people arrived, they, they were in a minivan and they were like just down to earth and they really enjoyed the time and so what that because that can get in your head sometimes if you really like you say like i would love to have people over or i would love to entertain but i would like for things to be 
you know, this fantasy in my head versus just, it's not about like a show for people. Why don't you just give people love? And I liked when, you know, when she talked about that, like that's the greatest gift that you can give someone is a place where they can be comfortable and, and free to be themselves. So I could um, appreciate that. I definitely related to the chapter on rest. I know you guys have probably heard me talk about it, you know, for the longest, because I feel like, you know, I'm just now learning like a sense of being. And that's just not something that was ingrained in me as a child. You know, um, I come from two parents who just have like off the charts work ethic. And so that's to have that down, but like the resting and the sense of being is just something, yeah, that I'm learning out. And there's just so many great, great quotes in that chapter. I mean, I read it twice because I just, I just love so many of the things that she thinks about. She talks about rest, you know, and we think of rest about being about like in Sabbath, about being like what you do and you don't do. And not from like a rules perspective, but you know, we think about like not doing things basically. And, um, she says, on page 198, it isn't, she says, rest isn't found just in the things we do or don't do. Often it's best experience, it, experience in the familiar rhythms of our lives. The sights, smells, and sound in our places of calm have a way of nurturing our spirits. I buy the same candle from our favorite hotel every time we're within driving distance of it. The reason is simple. It reminds us to rest, so I light it in our home in the evenings. Finding the sights and smells of rest heals our souls and fills our hearts. Again, this is because it isn't just something we find. It's a place we create. We relax where we feel safe. Find those places in your life and make it your rhythm to go there often. That struck me so deeply because, you know, with my seasonal living lifestyle, you know, it is restful for me to like decorate my home and light a candle and, you know, lay down and just like read or like journal or whatever. And that's such a beautiful image of rest. You know, rest can be a, a space you create. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, just what you do or don't do. So I thought that was really, really beautiful. And there was a few other beautiful quotes in that in that chapter too. All right. Uh, um, and then we'll just, we'll talk about quotes because I can not go a book chatting session without <laughs> getting my highlighter out and stealing all your favorite quotes and sharing my favorite quotes. So if you feel like you already said it, feel free to take a pass. But if you have a favorite quote, I would love to hear it. Margie, what was yours? Um, sorry if I steal this because I feel like it might be a popular one. But Erica, I'm also a nine on the Enneagram. I feel like we're kind of the same person. And this one resonated with me as an introvert. Um, and it, it was on page 134. She says, do more of what you're good at and less of everything else. And I think that's harder for introverts. <laughs> um, just because you sometimes feel like you have to live up to this pressure of like these I feel like all your heroes in America are like extroverted and perfect at Instagram and like all these things. And I'm like, I'm not good at this. Like I'm not even good at things that lots of people are good at. Um, and so it's coming back to that. What, am, what are the two things, even if there's only two that I'm good at, those are the ones I should do all the time. And then when I have to, you know, fill in with regular life stuff, I'll do that. Um, but I really appreciated that. Like, if that could be my life motto, I feel like I'd be a much more content, pleasant person <laughs> to be around. Uh, I had quite a few where I highlighted it. Um, but I think going back through them, I think this is the one that resonates the most with me right now. And that... Um, I don't even know where this is because I'm on the e, e version of it. Um, let me see if I can figure out what she's talking about here. Um, oh, I think it's when she's talking about um, having like other people in her life to like be her board of directors. I think it's that chapter. Um, she says, availability is the best teacher and love is the only lesson plan we need. Um, and that just resonated with me because right now um, I'm doing a lot of like reflecting on community and building community and um, like like building like a family of choice basically. Um, 
And like, I feel like just remembering that, you know, just being there for somebody is, um, and loving them the best that you know how to is sometimes all you need um, to like really be a true friend. Um, my favorite quote is actually uh, chapter one on page eight, top of the page, um, where she says, I think God wired a lot of us to remember just a few parts of our pain because he knows we don't need all of the details to remember the lessons we've learned. Um, boy, can I relate to this. Um, I think a lot of us use that as um, a coping mechanism to deal with stuff. And I can't tell you how many times someone will say, oh, well, don't you remember this happened? And you know, I might remember something happened, but certainly not uh, not all the details. So I really appreciate that quote because, uh, like I said, definitely relatable. Um, mine's in like the running away one when her kids were running away. It's on page one ten, um, kind of toward the bottom, uh, last full paragraph. Some people run away as a form of protest or a palace revolt, and they vote with their feet. Others do because they are ashamed of something that happened. Sheep aren't the only ones who get lost. More than a few shepherds do too. When we do, God is infinitely loving and accepting of us. He knows we'll return changed and desiring the kind of comfort and security only he can provide to us. And I just, I liked it. And right now our sermon series that just started like a week or two ago um, at church is on the prodigal son. And so it's like, just like right in the midst of like what we're kind of studying at church too. So I just found it to be like relevant to like, what I'm hearing right now. Uh, a couple of mine are just like random that I was writing down when I was listening. Um, um, I like the one that says, it is in the sinking that we find our rescue. Um, comparison is the thief of joy. And it's hard to see the familiar as holy. Um, I, I really like that one because I think sometimes that, you know, people are feel as if they're not seeing miracles anymore. And I'm just like, yeah, but you're seeing miracles in, in the small things and the simple things, um, you know, that we're not, it's not going to be like, you know, just light shining from the sky, miraculous, but it's going to be like, if you're looking for the, the little small things in life, how circumstances come together, how people come together, how you might have had a conversation with some with one person and then you ended up um, hearing something and then you needed that information for a later part in your life. Like I believe that that is like some of those miraculous things that are so simple that we, you know, that that we don't focus in on. But I see that you can see God in that. Um, and there was another one, but I don't think I wrote it down correctly. Um, but it was something like hearing lies about ourselves keeps us from seeing our true selves. But um, but those are my favorites. I really liked the epilogue. I thought it was really cool to hear from her kids. And, you know, I just I love the lifestyle that Bob and Maria lead. And it was kind of cool to hear like Maria's take on some of the stuff that was in Love Does. But um, so this is kind of around around that same this is very love desi, but um, one of the kids, one of the boys, it is Adam, says, everyone who is older might look like they have it together, but actually most of them have no clue what's going on either. And I was just talking to one of my best friends in LA. She owns a business here in LA and, you know, we were just talking how, about how, you know, it doesn't matter how old you get, you always feel like a kitten driving a Barbie car, you know, and it's like you expect when you're younger to wake up and like have it all together one day and like if you think everybody has it figured out and it's like no it doesn't so much come with age maybe a little <laughs> and then it says um the reality is that we are all more capable than we realize of creating a life of whimsy and adventure we're not flying without a net because of the community we have and the opportunity to cultivate one if we'll take the time that's the mindset i've grown up with take risk say yes fail big and change the world no matter who you are and where you are you're never flying without a net i loved that you're not flying without a net thought because you know even if you don't have you know someone in your life to catch you you know whether that's like financially or physically or you know or what you you know God really is gonna gonna catch us like he is the net and it really also this book really inspired me to 
really cultivate community. And I've been saying I'm going to do it for years, but since I moved to LA, I haven't really been successful. Not for lack of trying. It's just it's very difficult to cultivate community in LA unless they live within like a five mile radius of you and they're like in the same season of life. It's kind of tough because everyone's just kind of busy and like running around and like living their own dream. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that's really challenged me since I've um, moved here and it's kind of a, a book that inspired me to, to recommit. So yeah, on to the next. So the next question we kind of talked about already, so I'm going to skip it. And it was, how did the structure structure of the book affect the story? And I stuck that one in just because, you know, like we had been talking about, I felt like this book would have been excellent with some structure. Like when I think about Gretchen Rubin's book, The Happiness Project, and, you know, Gretchen has said this herself, what made that book was the structure. She had, like, something that she worked on every month of the year. And maybe that just really resonated with me because that's who I am, right? Um, but, like, the structure made that book. And she talked about, Gretchen talked about how, you know, she spent, like, a year coming up with the right structure for that book because she thought it was crucial. And reading this just made me think a lot about that, that just, like, structure is everything. And I just, oh, I just, I just wanted more for this little book. <laughs> I feel like similar to uh, Into the Water. Like I, I wanted more from that book. I wanted like, yeah, we, like we talked about, I wanted like witch trials and all this, all this stuff be worked in more. And then it's kind of like, wait, no, what? <laughs> all right. So the last question, did Love Lives Here inspire you um, to, you know, incorporate something from Bob and Maria's life into your own? So like signing the table, for example, I thought that was so beautiful as well. And, and just like, they have such a beautiful way of injecting levity into their life that I would just love to emulate. You know, I can take things too seriously and <laughs> um, you know, even having like a very whimsical job you know it's it's still it's still a lot um of course you know there's like production budgets and of course you know a, you know payroll and all this stuff um but i just feel like every it feels like every day they do something that just like brings that lightness to the surface and i need more of that and that's perhaps why um these books resonate with me so much so there's so many i know one of you said that you took notes for when you have your future family and i felt the same way so um besides signing the table margie did you have any um moments where you're like i need to do that that's such a cute idea yeah it wasn't one thing it's more of a way to live your life um and it's actually something i've thought of and talked about before. I had a very good friend. I have a very good friend who, when her sister got married, she said, you're signing up for your marriage and no one else's. Um, and Maria kind of said the same thing. It was go be your family, not someone else's. So like that, I think comparison is, can be my downfall. Um, and that is a huge, hurdle I feel like I have to overcome and so those reminders of like my marriage is special and it's my own and it doesn't need to be like anyone else's and my future family is my own and it doesn't need to be like anyone else's and the fact that someone's is different is awesome they can be their own family and they don't need to be like ours so I think just that constant reminder um, is something that I want to implement and need to like remind myself of daily. Um, kind of along the same lines, um, after reading this book, um, because I've been thinking about it because of, I, I can't even remember um, if it was a book that I read or an article or a podcast or what it was, but um, there's been a few places lately where I like I've been hearing about like what's the atmosphere that you want your home to have like if somebody walks into your house do you want it to be a place of like fun or acceptance or love and I mean obviously we want you know probably everybody wants their home to have like certain aspects of it but like what's the thing that you want and so like when I finished reading this book I was thinking about that and so I had a conversation with one of my kids about like what do you like what what do you want out of a home like not a house like not like what amenities are you looking for but um like what's the emotions you want to feel when you're in your house like do you want it to be like loud and chaotic and fun or like peaceful and um 
And so we like had a conversation about that. And one of my kids, like, there's no way he would let me have a conversation with him about that. He would like change the subject or walk away or something. Um, but like, I was able to have that conversation with some of my family members. Um, and like, uh, well, is that what you feel in the house? And just kind of having that conversation, which it's not necessarily um, explicitly talked about that. Um, but it was something that I was thinking about as I was reading the book. Um, and so it inspired me to have those conversations with my family and um, like think about um, creating somewhere where, you know, people will say that the title of the book, like that's where love lives and somewhere that I, I want to be, um, especially the people that, you know, live here um, and are here on a regular Is it me? Yes, it is you. Okay. okay. Um, oh my gosh, sorry. I totally got distracted by my son and now my brain is off. Um, I think the thing that I took away, which is something like I always like want to do, and I feel like how come <laughs> which I know like we're not supposed to be like comparing or whatever, but like it seems like so many of these writers like have like a specific vacation spot they always go to or like like this, you know, like something they always do. And I, I've always kind of wanted like a vacation home. Um, when I was really little, my grandparents had a place out in um, Bullhead City at the Colorado River. And so I think that kind of always stuck with me. But when my grandpa passed away, when I was five, my grandma had to sell it because she just couldn't keep up two homes by herself without, you know, another adult. But I think I've always wanted like some type of vacation home, which is, I totally joked with Sarah earlier um, about that. Like you can find me a vacation home because it's just something, I don't know. I like that idea of like, you go to a specific place like time and again and like, um, you know, and although I would love to travel like everywhere also, um, I just, I don't know. I, I just like the idea of like the routine of it. Like we go here and that's our thing. And um, my aunt and uncle like would go to Minnesota for like a month every year and they like had a specific cabin they would go to and rent. And so I, I think that's something I'd like to take away. I, I mean, obviously I don't think I can buy like a giant piece of property like they did in build a lodge. And I love the way they use their lodge, but I just think like kind of the routine of a vacation. Cause we've kind of had like, Right now, it's like wherever my husband happens to work that's out of town in the summer that we can like tag along and like use the free hotel room that's paid for by the company because he's working. And so like we went to like Reno this summer or in like last summer it was Vegas and the summer before it was, it was Laughlin because it seems like they only send in places in the summer where there's gambling. And <laughs> but I would like to have like a place like to go. That's like that's our place. I totally agree. I'm so glad you said that because I was thinking that like, cause Shauna Nyquist talks about her lake house, right? Like that's in all of her books. And you, that reminded me so much of that lake house that she talks about. And she just, so much of her writing occurs there. And that is such a beautiful dream. I, I think that's, that's going to be on my life list too. I would just love to be able to spend the somewhere, spend the summer somewhere else. That is a beautiful vision. Um, I know a lot of you and me too liked how there was a story about the paper plates where they shuffled the plates and like wrote a star on the bottom of them. And um, the person who got the star paper plate to, got to uh, pick, pick what dessert was. And that was just so cute. A lot of those things, you know, are interesting because they have like a family of five. And for me, I grew up in such a small family. It was just me and my parents. So, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's kind of cool having that little window into like such a big family life. But then at the same time, because, you know, I was raised in such like a quiet home. I, I don't know if I could handle like that much action. You know, she talked about that in the book too. So yeah, it's, it's Erica, you talked about this some too. And I think it's really interesting to like think about the life that, you know, you want to create and like 
how, where, and where and how you feel most comfortable and out rest and at rest. So anywho, so we've been having like a sidebar conversation about the Enneagram earlier this year. We did a lot of personality type icebreakers. We did like the Gretchen Rubin four tendencies. We did like, what's your reading personality? And I think we did one more and I'm blanking on what it is, but the Enneagram is a fun one too. It's basically, um, you know, just another personality type where there's nine different types. So you're either a one through nine. Um, I'm a one and I think it would be fun to do an icebreaker and have that be our icebreaker. We're going to do a, what should I read next, next um, month for August. And, but we'll do that for September. We'll do the Enneagram for September. If anyone knows like, of a quick and dirty kind of walkthrough of the Enneagram, let me know. Um, I know that on What Should I Read Next, she had, um, I think it was two episodes ago, they did a really quick walkthrough of the Enneagram from an author, I'm blanking on his name, who um, wrote The Road Back to You, uh, which is an Enneagram book. Um, so anyway, I think that'd be really fun for September. So let me know if you have any other resources besides that last podcast where they where they went over everything because that's kind of a cool a cool topic. Does Ann Bogle's book go into it? Um, reading people? Does anybody know? I have it and I haven't read it yet, but that might be a good one. Yeah, she has a chapter on the Enneagram where she just kind of explains like a short description of each type. Okay, could you tell like really quickly which one you were? I already knew my type, so. I don't know if you would be able to tell from the short descriptions or not. Okay. Yeah. I need to find one that's like a short little description. It is similar. It's like kind of similar to Myers-Briggs, but I feel like Myers-Briggs is so much more complex. Um, and I don't even know, like it's been a long time since I did the, the Myers-Briggs. So it's hard for me to compare, but yeah, without all like the craziness of Myers-Briggs. <laughs> um, all right. So I think that's a wrap for tonight. Um, I would love to know if you do read, you know, any of the companion books by Bob Goff, either Love Does or Everybody Always. Um, I love hearing what you guys are reading in our Facebook group and on Instagram. Um, so fun to, to read your reviews. And so next month we're going to be reading all the ugly and wonderful things. This was kind of like the paper and glam book club reader selection. I think I got maybe 50 messages saying I had to put this on next year's book list. And with such so many glowing reviews, I of course did. So that is our, our book for next month. I was gonna say next August. I have it linked below. I should give you guys the date just in case there's anything crazy. There's not five, there is five Thursdays in August. I knew that was gonna happen. So it's gonna be the 30th of August when we will discuss all oh, the ugly and wonderful things which is described as a modern day Beauty and the Beast but I've heard it's very 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 dark so it's there's no Lumiere coming to you know sing you be my guest so all right thank you so much girlfriends for joining us those of you that joined us live I'm so excited that you took time out of your day to hang with us and if you're watching the replay thank you thank you thank you I'm so excited that you're here Tell a friend that they need to join our book club because we have so much fun together. And until August 30th, good night, girlfriends.